Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're less than 72 hours away from the opening of the season, and Matt and I are back for another season of Fireside Chat. Tonight, we're going to be looking ahead at everything that's to come. But Matt, how are you doing this week? Good. I'm excited for Flames Hockey to start up again against those Vancouver Canucks. Get to beat them up again after knocking them out of the playoffs last year. It should be a good, fun season. This weekend, I'll be giving thanks for yet another NHL season and hopefully for what looks like it's going to be a great season to be a Flames fan. All right, well, why don't we, why don't we start with uh, talking about the last part of training camp. Training camp is finished now. And uh, Matt, in training camp, were there any pleasant surprises for you? Uh, for me, it was Garnett Hathaway. He seemed to step up the most of any of the younger players and really fought for hard for a roster spot. He ultimately did not make the cut, but he showed a lot of progression even from the end of last year, and that's what you want to see from players that you sign as free agents like they did last year. Yeah, you and I were at a few of the preseason games together, and uh, even when we went to the Colorado game, Hathaway was, I mean, even though that was a pretty veteran-laden squad, to me, Hathaway was the most noticeable guy on the ice, which I thought was great. And I really thought he could be this year's Josh Juris. I thought he could be kind of the rookie that comes out of nowhere that nobody's expecting and might actually be able to make the team. Yeah, and like we saw him last year when we covered the AHL, and he would always find a way to be involved in the play, whether it was jumping in front of the net to screen the goaltender like he just has really good overall instincts for how to play as a depth forward like a good third fourth line type guy and we'll see especially as the season goes on but I would not be surprised if he played or was one of the first call-ups depending on who gets injured as the season goes on yeah you were mentioning how he plays as a good depth guy and I think just as we've seen with Josh Juris, he understands his role on the team. He's not trying to be more than he is. He's not trying to, um, you know, he's not trying to put himself in a different role. He's a big winger who plays a strong defensive game. I'd say he plays a very hard-nosed style, and that's exactly what, you know, the team needs at certain points. And I think by him saying, okay, this is who I am, he's going to earn himself a spot on the team either this year or maybe next year. Yeah, and like when we did watch him last year, most of his goals were scored right in front of the goalie, and like I, I don't even think he had any goals that were with you know more than ten feet away from the crease. So he knows how to generate offense as well. I do believe he had seventeen goals last season. So there is some offensive talent there as well as being a steady two-way forward. I really think he's going to be a guy who's going to progress down a similar career path as sort of a Lance Boma, a guy who can be an offensive threat when we need him to, but a guy who, you know, is probably going to spend most of his career sort of being that uh, gritty sort of physical forward. And you can never have too many of those. Uh, you probably could. I mean, you wouldn't want, you know, 12 forwards in that role, but yeah, I think he could be a good bottom six guy in that role. Um, another guy, guy that really impressed me who has actually made the team was Brett Kulak. If you would have asked me coming into the season of all the defensemen I thought was going to make the team, Kulak would not have been on that list. What were your thoughts of him in the preseason? He is just very steady. And I, I know this is going to sound a little weird, but he reminds me quite a bit of TJ Brody when he broke into the NHL, where he, he isn't 100% comfortable either in the offensive zone or the defensive zone but he does enough things right that you have to give him a shot in the NHL to see if he can take that next step and when Brody was uh, in the process of making the team for his rookie season he was having some issues and it didn't quite wasn't quite as composed as Kulak was even but 
then when the season started, things started to really click for Brody, and he eventually went on to become the stellar defenseman that he is. So if Kulak can get some NHL games under his belt and then take those similar steps, the Flames might have a really excellent defenseman on their hands. Do you think that Brett Kulak would have made the team if not for the TJ Brody injury? Probably not. Just due to the fact that you ha- you would have had six defensemen, and with him being such a young player, it would be better to have him getting top-line minutes in Stockton. But, you know, injuries can be a blessing in disguise, and if Kulak can come and steal a spot, then the team's better for it. For sure. I mean, if we would have talked about players that I thought would potentially, young guys who we thought might challenge for that position, I thought it might be Watherspoon, Morrison, Shillington, Anderson. So I'm really happy to see Kulak sort of in that role and being the guy who, like you said, he's put in the hard work, he's been around for a while, he's able to show something. And I think, too, it's going to separate him from Ryan Culkin, who I know you especially have always kind of grouped together, almost like one player. I think this really is going to start to separate those two out. Oh, for sure. And it's actually kind of weird because when the Flames drafted the pair of them, like when they went to select with their fourth round pick, that was one, two on their list. And they were kind of shocked that Culkin was there when they went and selected again in the fifth round. And stylistically, they are very similar. It's just that with Culkin being injured a couple of times, and missing developmental time that Kulak has been able to use that excess time to push himself a little further ahead. For those that don't know a lot about Brett Kulak, he's a Canadian kid. He's 21 years old. Uh, he's six foot one, 190 pounds, and he's he was a 2012 fourth round pick, pick number 105 by the Flames, and he played his WHL career for the Vancouver Giants, and then he's been around our various incarnations of AHL teams with Abbotsford and Adirondack, and even played some ECHL time last year with Colorado, which is where he played most of the year. So I think it's really cool that he can go from being an ECHL defenseman to, you know, making the NHL team. Well, that's part of the reason uh, with the Flames having such depth in their minor league system that players that do have potential can be assigned to the ACHL and like we'll even see that again this year because the Stockton Heat have I think like 19 or 20 forwards at the moment and like 12 defensemen so some of those guys will get signed to Adirondack to play in the ECHL. Talking about uh, training camp surprises here guys we were pleasantly surprised about a guy that i didn't know a lot about coming in but i think we'd both say uh has probably surprised us and that's yakub nakladal yeah for sure and like even in his european career he wasn't really that much of a standout and for whatever reason the flames saw something in him and decided to offer him a contract and he really stepped up he still has to get used to the north american ice Uh, i saw him a couple of times lose his positioning just a little bit not a big deal but when the games actually count you can't have a guy doing that but the rest of his game, though, is pretty good, and he's very good at like poking the puck off of opposing forward sticks as they're trying to come into the zone, and he's just a very solid defenseman. I would not be shocked if, say, in like December or January that he gets recalled if another injury comes up down the pike he's also 27 years old and i think this one for flames fans to remember is he's not a rookie i mean he's been playing you know for many many years over in the khl um and you know various international tournaments and that sort of thing but he's 27 so you know he's really at that point in his career where we're almost coming off the the peak if you will if you look the most guys peak about 30 31 so i think it's it's apt that you'd expect that he would be one of the better guys considering he's one of the older guys True, and he didn't look too out of place, and if the Flames didn't have 
guys like Derek England and Ladislav Schmid, in addition to guys like Kulak and Watherspoon and that, it, it would have been more likely that he would have got a spot right from the get-go. But it'll take some time, but I could see him even being a replacement next year as the Flames continue on with trying to mold their team into a contender. You can never have too many good defensive defensemen in the system. And, you know, to me, this kind of erases the memory of Roman Trevanka, the last sort of overage Russian guy the Flames brought in, who I think we could probably all say was a bust. I think looking at Nakladal, at least early, we can say, okay, this one worked out well for us. Yeah, sure. Uh, we'll have to see if he and when he gets an audition at the NHL level. Well, even if he can provide some good depth at the AHL level, I think that Stockton's probably, you know, destined to try and run for a playoff spot this year. And if he can help with that, I think that, you know, for a guy who's on a one-year deal, you know, that would be good. Yeah, can't hurt. And would you say that the best way, if we're trying to describe Knock at all, the fans that haven't seen him, um, probably a defensive defenseman? Yeah, it's weird, though. He has a really dynamite slap shot. It's not that far off of in hardness as Dennis Weidman's. It's just that he's not nearly as accurate with it as Weidman is. So uh, you will see him like take slap shots, like, and it will hit the guy that's defending him right in front of him. So where Weidman can find a way to make sure that the puck doesn't hit the guy too often. And looking at Nakladal's game and looking at how he's been used in the past in Russia, I think that whether he's in Calgary or Stockton, he's a guy that's going to see a lot of time on the penalty kill. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think Nakladal will be up here. I think we'll see him in a flaming sea sooner rather than later. Um, it's just going to be a matter of what happens with the defense. Last year, we hardly had any defensive injuries. Gio was really the only defenseman that got hurt for you know, more than a few days. So I think that's really going to depend on what happens with the D this year. But we're prepared. Yeah, exactly. And you, usually a team needs eight or nine defensemen throughout the course of a season just to get through because injuries always do happen. So, you know, like we can see that right now with both Smead and uh, TJ Brody are still out and will be for the next couple of weeks. So, you know, if another injury happens, I'm sure that Nakladal would be the first call-up. So, looking at training camp again, we've looked at the guys we were impressed by. Was there anyone that really disappointed you? Someone who you thought would have come in and had to have a good camp and didn't? Yeah, number 21, Mason Raymond. He, yeah, when you're fighting for your NHL career and you have a training camp like that yeah if he wasn't under contract and was a tryout guy he would have been cut well and the thing i find interesting about raymond too is he didn't have a great postseason i mean of all the players in the team i think we could say he's the one that didn't have a great playoff showing so i was really expecting him to go back and work his butt off over the summer do whatever he had to do to you know up his skills get a bit better all those sort of things whatever it was that he had to do and we just we didn't see that from him you know we didn't see Really, I don't think any change, and I know that since he's been here, there's been a lot of criticism on him, and I wanted to give him a fair shake, which I think we have now, but yeah, I mean, he did not look like a guy who, you know, is going to make an NHL roster on a team competing for a playoff spot. No, and I don't even think with how he played that he would make, like, the Arizona Coyotes or any of the other teams that are fighting in the Austin Matthews sweepstakes. What if we shift him up north? You think he'd make their team? No, honestly. Wow. He, yeah, it's one of those things. And, it, you know, if he can figure out what's wrong and correct it, that would be good. Cause do you think that an AHL stint can help him with that, or do you think that he's pretty much done at the NHL level? If he doesn't turn it around imminently like i'd give him the same shot that the flames gave setaguchi perhaps not 12 games but a handful to see if he can snap out of it and if not then park him in stockton and you know hopefully he can work with huska and figure out some way of revitalizing himself otherwise i think in the offseason you buy him out 
Yeah, that could very well be. I mean, he's going to be quite expensive if they wanted to keep him down there, you know, past this season. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can totally agree with you. I think that maybe he goes down there. Maybe he, you know, revitalizes his game. Um, maybe even, I mean, he's only got two years. If you don't want to buy him out, um, you know, maybe you do, uh, I don't know, at 3.1 million. Yeah, I think you almost have to buy him out at the end of the year. But I think that he'll probably be looked at to be a veteran leader down on the farm. Yeah, worst case scenario is you buy him out. It, it, and luckily we only have two years. It's not like we're buying out a six-year deal. Exactly. Not like Andrew McDonald or Vincent LeCavalier with the Flyers. But, you know, it's one of those problems that it, hopefully he can sort himself out and reestablish himself. Because if not, like, this is the last contract that he's going to have in the NHL. And, you know, hopefully he's looking at this and saying it's bad time to start saving my money because there's no way he's making upwards of, you know, $3.15 million again in any contract in his career. No, unless he, like, figures it out all of a sudden and puts up, like, a 50-point season each of the next two years or something yeah, like that. which, you know, we know is probably not going to happen. So hopefully he's saving that money because I think he'll be lucky to get upwards of, you know, $2 million for the rest of his career. Yeah, if another contract at all. Yeah, I think there's somebody that would probably take him on, even at an AHL level. But, you know, with the way that the free agency's gone this summer, you never know what could happen in the future. Um, you'd also mentioned earlier that you thought Drew Short a bit of a disappointing camp. Yeah, he's one of those players that has, like, all the parts that you would want in a good sec or third, fourth line guy. He just can't seem to put them all together to make it work. And it's really frustrating because, like, he's big, good in face-offs, decently quick, decent shot. Like, all the things that you would want in a depth player, it's just for whatever reason, he's just not able to find that gelling of those skills to make it all work. And he seems to have brilliant stints. Like, we'll see times when you look at him on the ice and you'll go, wow, this guy's pretty good. And then the next game, he doesn't look great again. Yeah, it, it's a little weird, but development is never a linear process. And with Shore having another extended stint in the AHL and having him getting first-line minutes like I'm sure he will, that should help him try to get that consistency in his game that he seems to be lacking. Because he does have all the parts that you would want in a good fourth-line center. You know, big, he wins a lot of face-offs. He throws a hit every once in a while. It's just not... He was not good enough to even take a winger spot or beat out Matt Stage, and which is what he needed to do. You know what, though? I still think that, um, I don't know, like, he's getting to be an older guy, and he's had his chance at the AHL. It's not that this guy hasn't had a chance, and I really think that if Shore doesn't put something together this year, he's probably going to be at the next uh, Max Reinhardt, and that we're just going to have to, you know, probably flip him for a mid-round pick and move on, because, again, I think, just like Reinhardt, there's going to be guys that are going to jump over him in the depth chart. That... It will be entirely up to him, and if he can figure it out, then he'll be a useful player for the Flames down the road. If not, you have to move on, because like we got Jankowski coming in next year, who will be playing in the AHL, and he'll need the first line minutes where Short, you know, and he'll in effect take short spot, so... Yeah, you'll have to figure something out. Yeah, I just feel like Shores had enough chances at the NHL level to try and put something together. He's had lots of time at the AHL level to put something together. I feel like if he still can't figure out his game and what he needs to do, he's maybe never going to do so. And that's a possibility. But with a guy that has his size, you try to give him every opportunity because if he does figure it out, then you've got a dynamite third, fourth line guy. So it's one of those things you just have to wait and see. There's just not enough information at this exact precise moment. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I hope for Drew's sake that he puts it together. But 
you know, this was another guy that I thought if the flight, like he had to clear waivers, his waiver eligibility was done last year. And there's a lot of talk about how he'd probably make the team because of that. So when the Flames put him on waivers, I was a bit nervous and I'm a little bit surprised that he cleared waivers. Oh, so am I. Like I would have figured that some team out there could have used his overall package of abilities, but well, and GMs all like a project too, so I could see somebody take him on almost as their project player. Yeah, because like as I mentioned before, the Coyotes like they're pretty terrible. You could have figured that they might have been able to use somebody like that, but obviously not. So, so I, I think that the Flames were fortunate that he snuck through waivers, and I don't know that he would do the same as the season starts and injuries start mounting. So I really think if they've got to make a decision soon if he's up or if he's down. Yeah. Well, I don't think he'll get recalled until, like, the unless he does figure it out and is ready to stick. Because I, I would rather see either Granlund or Arnold come up if a center goes I down. Agree. Just because you can send them back. And I'm hoping with Shore that he's going to look at this as, I mean, last year he was kind of the next guy in line. And like you said, I think there's a couple of guys that have jumped him in line on the depth chart this year. And I hope he looks at this as a challenge. Yeah, well, it's the same thing like with Watherspoon. Uh, he was the go-to guy at coming into the training camp. And both Nakladal, Wilson, and uh, Kulak all jumped over him. So... You know, it, he has to improve as well. It Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. This is Shore's last year on his deal, as far as I can see. So I have a feeling, you know, excuse me, it's a contract year. Um, I have a feeling that if he doesn't make anything of him, the Flames just going to walk away. And that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. No, I don't think we need to keep him around after this. I wouldn't sign him to just a one-year deal just because. Yeah, he needs to show something. Yeah. And that's the thing with most of the prospects. like It's getting to the point of make-or-break time. Like Guys like uh, Granlin, for example, he needs to show that not only is he a good AHL player, but that he can actually stick at the NHL level. Yeah, yeah, you could be right. I think, yeah, Granlin's a, a different case too. But yeah, I think that Granlin, right now at least for me, Granlin is above shore on the depth chart. Yeah, same here. I think he's shown more of a complete game at the NHL level, if you look at his body of work, than Drew Shore. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, moving on from training camp. Training camp's over, and as usually we see at the end of camp, uh, there's been some guys on waivers. We talked about Drew Shore being put on waivers. Uh, Mason Raymond was put on waivers, which was a surprise to some people. I think you and I talked a bit about that last week. But the guy that was a surprise to me was Paul Byron being put on waivers. Yeah, it's one of those things that the Flames need to have flexibility in their roster, especially with three guys on the IR. And you don't like seeing a guy that is skilled, it, like Byron, going on waivers, but of all the forwards, he is the most likely to clear because he's five foot six, and not too many guys that are that height get claimed on waivers. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, and I think, I don't know, if you look at Byron, even last year, I was surprised they stuck with the team all year. Like, he was going up and down. He was almost like a Drew Shore. He was coming up for a couple games and then going down. And last year, he finally stuck here. And I thought, oh, good. You know, he got himself a break and he's playing well. But, again, I think that if you look at Byron, I don't know if there's that much difference from what we've seen in Byron than a guy like uh, Bill Arnold or, you know, Goud or uh, not Goudreau, Bill Arnold or, um, you know, any of those other centers that we've got um, coming through the system. Uh, Granlund's a good example, you know, and I think that there's, they might be just trying to, you know, kind of send him a bit of a message that you're on the bubble. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that the Flames need to have the best players on the team. And for me, Byron wasn't exactly spectacular in the games that he did play in training camp. The team has to improve, and like we're s sort of like in the tail end of a rebuild and kind of building towards going into contender mode. And you can't have passengers on the team, and a player like Byron 
it, unless he can like start playing and like potting those goals on those breakaways that he did last didn't last year you have to move on and the flames especially in the division that they play they can't have too many players that are short on their team and when you got Goudreau, Hoodler and Byron that are all undersized and even Sam Bennett isn't exactly tall it's difficult when you're going up against Anaheim who has a whole bunch of players that are like 6'4", 6'5". LA same thing. San Jose same thing. The Jets same thing. It, it You can beat them but it's more difficult if you're getting pushed off the puck i've never been a huge paul byron fan i've never thought that he really had um, what it takes to be an nhl regular on a regular basis i think that he fell into a spot last year but i think this is going to be good for his career i think you know he'll probably get sent reassigned back to the ahl and either you know be looked at as sort of a, a veteran leader there or you know, you get lost in the shuffle. And again, a guy who's on a one-year deal, so if it doesn't work out, I still think that he could have some trade value. Um, maybe, you know, there's some in the works there, and this is just giving them some flexibility, but I think it's going to be good for him to have to earn that spot again. Yeah, and the uh, mantra of always earned, never given, that's exactly this case. And Byron didn't outplay the other guys on the team. Unfortunately, it's a numbers game, and he's on the short end of the stick. Yeah, and it's probably better for him to go to the HL if he clears than sit on the bench here in Calgary. Uh, I'd probably keep him up just because it's easier, uh, because it depends on uh, which team you're playing. Like, if you got a team that's more physical, you'd need a guy like Bolig in, but if you're going up against a more passive team... Byron could be more useful in that regard. So for those that don't know waiver rules, once a guy's cleared, he can stay in the NHL or be sent to the HL and go back and forth for 30 days or 10 games if they play 10 games. So you're thinking that they'd probably just have Byron clear and keep him in Calgary? Yeah, and like once guys like Smead, Brody, and Colborn get off the IR, then if there's no subsequent injuries, then you have that flexibility of sending both Byron and Raymond down to Stockton without having to waive them and having more increased likelihood of them getting claimed. So that was my first question, So, would, or my next question. So would you send uh, Raymond down right away, or would you keep him in Calgary too? I'd probably keep him in Calgary as well, and I might even play him a few games as well just to hopefully let him have the space to work out his problems. And if he can't, like pretty much right off the bat then yeah whoever is the first off the IR he gets sent down like I'd even like even if Brody and Smeed are the first guys off I'd rather keep Kulak up than Raymond interesting see I do the exact opposite with Raymond I would send him to the A I think he's had time to prove himself he had last season he didn't look good uh, he, it's not like he's looked good in camp and we can say, well, he's starting to come around. I'd just send him to the A right away and say, you know, show us you should be brought back. Yeah, either way. Uh, it, we'll see in the next couple of days. Uh, I There's a solid argument for either. So with those roster moves then, taking a look at what's, what looks like our opening day roster, very similar to last year. Um, we've talked about the additions, the subtractions, um, any names on the opening day roster that you're surprised to see there? Uh, not particularly other than maybe Kulak, but he didn't, he, he played so well in the preseason that he is not really a surprise that he's there at the end. Any names you're surprised not seen on the opening day roster? Uh, same thing. Not really. I would, I would agree with you about Kulak. I'd say that I'm surprised that uh, Morrison didn't make the roster. I think coming in, we were all expecting Kenny Morrison to at least get a roster spot. And, you know, especially with injuries, I thought he was going to get one. It's one of those things. Kulak just outperformed him. Yeah, but I guess looking at just the names on paper, you know, before yeah, true. preseason, true. I, I would not have expected Kulak. I would have expected Morrison or Shillington or, or uh, Anderson to get that role. Before the training camp started, I, I was kind of figuring that Morrison would be the guy to step up as well, but it didn't happen, and it's one of those things that 
he's in his he's a first year pro. He only played like I think ten or eleven games last year in Adirondack, so it it takes a little while for players to adjust, and he didn't make it a big enough adjustment as fast to make the team this year out of the gate. But I do expect him to play at least at some point this season. See, I'm not sure he hasn't made enough of an adjustment. When I look at him, I'm thinking it's probably just better for him to play more minutes. I mean, even if you look at a guy like Kulak, he'll probably be a 5'6 guy up here in Calgary. And I'd want Morrison playing more than 5'6 minutes. So I think even if he was the next guy in line, I might almost leave him in the A and say, okay, you're going to stay in the A and you're going to you know, play more minutes and hone those skills a bit better for when we need you. Yeah, I could see that. Um, especially because we're in this weird sort of rebuild but challenger spot at the same time. We have to be be careful that we manage some of these young guys in a different way than you might if you were just a challenger. So good for Kulak for making the team. Uh, he's a guy that's been around here forever. I think, you know, it's nice to see those guys that the Flames have drafted, developed, and then they make the team. So I'm curious to see what happens with Brett, and I'm hoping that he can play himself into a full-time position this year. I'm hoping he can make the Flames make a hard decision and maybe have to move another defenseman for him. Yeah, well, that's the thing that I'm looking forward to the most in the the early part of the year is his play. And for those that don't know, I don't even know what his number is. What's his training camp number? 61. 61. What a weird number for a defenseman. So Brody was 66 when he tried out uh, Kulak 61. So watch for 61 on the ice and take a look at what Kulak's doing. Every year, there's always it's always the th- the kind of question is who is the last guy cut from camp? And this year, the last guy cut was Marcus Granlin. Are you surprised that Granlin's not going to be wearing a flaming C for the opening day? No, only because he is a waiver exempt, and it was somewhat similar last year with Josh Juris, who was also the last cut. It he came in and he played really well, and if the Flames had a roster spot, he would have made it. It's just you have too many guys with one-way contracts. Somebody's got to go. He's easy to send down because of the fact that he does have a two-way deal. I think this is last year that he's two-way, isn't he? Yeah, and it it's his last year of waiver exemption as That's well. That's what I mean, so, yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. I, I th- expect like if any of the forwards get hurt, it, he'll be the first call-up. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think that we were not done seeing Granlin this year and I still think that Granlin could play himself into a roster spot yeah I could even see Granlin playing 40 or 50 or 60 games with the Flames depending on how things go it's just for the first week or so of the season at least he won't be in the Flames dressing room but well, I think we can probably both agree, too, that there's still another shoe to drop for the Flames. There's still transactions, probably not, you know, call-ups and send-downs, but a trade of some kind that has to be made. And that might be what they're waiting for to give Granlund his roster spot. Oh, for sure. And now that, like, everybody's had enough time to evaluate their team, they know their strengths, their, they know their weaknesses, and now you can start calling and saying, oh, I really need a good, solid defensive defenseman, say... Uh, will you eat a little bit of either Smeet or England's contract and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's always going to be something, and the Flames having well, we an got, excess... I mean, we got three goalies still, so we got to get rid of some goalies. Yeah, so there's... The Flames have too many good players in every position, so it, the shoe will have to drop. It's just who, what, and for how much. <laughs> yeah, and and I really think that that's where... I think they're sending Granlin down just because they need to get to roster limits, but I would not be surprised if after whatever trade is coming, he's brought back up. And like you said, he probably plays the majority of the season here. So other than that, there's only one other real roster move from uh, training camp, and that's that Ryan Wilson was released from his part-time tryout agreement. Um, Wilson was a guy that we thought that the Flames might sign. He has a bit of a history here. Are you surprised that he got released? Uh, n- yes and no. Uh, if it wasn't for Brett Kulak stepping up, Wilson would have been signed. 
it's just that there's no room for both Wilson and and Aaron Johnson in Stockton. Do you think Johnson is the better choice than Wilson? Not not, not from a pure talent perspective, but perhaps from a leadership perspective because he is older than Wilson. So he might be a better fit for Stockton. Wilson, though, I fully expect him to get a contract from somebody because he did do a good job. It's just uh, a numbers game, and we had too many good players, and he just didn't make the cut. I was reading the uh, the rules around PTOs today on my lunch break, and from what I understand, he could still actually accept an AHL deal from Stockton if they wanted to go that way. So if they said, hey, you know, we want this guy, we don't want to take a Flames contract, but we want to give him a deal, he could still accept that. So I, I don't think it's going to happen, but I agree with you. I don't think he's done in North America. I think somebody's going to give him a deal. Yeah, and I could see him, like, his agent calling around all the teams in the next week to say, well, hey, I played, hit, my client played well. You know, you need a six seven guy. He's, like, perfect for that job, so... If he doesn't get signed, like, within the next week or two, I could see, like, a team like the Flames or somebody else signing him to an AHL contract. Well, and the other thing, too, I don't know what his desires are, what his agent's desires are, but this could also up his um, his salary demands in Europe, kind of saying, hey, you know, this guy has played well, someone's going to sign him, you should sign him right now. Yeah, true. So if he wants to go over to Europe, maybe he could get a better payday there than he could here. Excuse me, this might help his, his ability to do that. Um, and then the last move, I guess, before we talk about move away from training camp and talk about the season, is the Flames' first official trade of the year. Um, I was surprised by this. Um, I was not expecting this to be the first trade. I was expecting a trade to happen and a big shoe to drop. And when somebody told me the Flames made a trade, I was expecting big names to be flying around. But the Flames traded a conditional seventh round pick in 2016 to the Colorado Avalanche and, and acquired uh, centerman and winger Freddie Hamilton. And yes, Freddie Hamilton is the brother of new defenseman Dougie Hamilton. Well, it's always good to show that the new guy that the Flames just acquired that, you know, we want you here long term, so let's get your brother in the organization as well. We'll see. Uh, Hamilton's one of those players that he's been a, a pretty good player at the AHL level, but he just hasn't been able to click at the NHL level, especially with his offense. Like, I don't even think he had any points last year in 17 games with the Avalanche. He had one goal. Okay, well, there you go. It's one of those things, like, uh, he's somewhat reminiscent of Ben Street for fans that remember him, but where just a solid top scorer at the AHL level, and at least to this point hasn't been able to click at the NHL level. I wonder if he was feeling lonely because he was Doug Less. Lame. Um, if, if we look at um, Freddie's stats here, in 2011, or 2010-2011, he played for the Niagara Ice Dogs in the OHL. He got 83 points. 2011-2012, uh, again with Niagara, 86 points. He got drafted by the Sharks. He was drafted in uh, 2010 as a fifth-round pick. He played for War for uh, Worcester, their farm team. He got 26 points, had 11 appearances the next year in the AHL, zero points. So like you said, he got 43 in 2013-2014, 43 points at the A level. Again, nothing with the Sharks last year. And last year he jumped between San Jose, Worcester, Colorado, and Lake Erie. So... Maybe the reason that he wasn't doing as well was he was jumping around a lot. Um, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking this could be the guy that replaces Drew Shore. Possibly. He's 23. He's a center. He's sort of that project centerman. Um, you know, if they keep him around, he, this could be the next Drew Shore. It, you can never have enough guys that have skill at the AHL level because of the fact that it does help develop your other guys that do have NHL potential. And there's always the off chance that those guys actually figure it out. So, could Hamilton and Shore make the NHL and stick full-time? Sure. Just like anybody else could. But if not, at least you got guys that 
say, guys like Klimchuk and Poirier can pass the puck to and it won't go over their stick or, you know, like they won't mess up the plays. So uh, it'll help everybody by having, like, more talent is always better than less. What do you think the chance is that we see, um, let's say this season, because it's easy to, it, easier to predict, but what do you think the chance is that we see both Hamilton brothers on the ice in a flaming sea this year? It might happen. It probably wouldn't happen till towards the end of the year or if the Flames ran into a whole bunch of injuries, but I could see it. It might only be for like a couple of games, but or it might even be like the last game of the season, like how the Flames had Ramage, Watherspoon, and Kulak in the lineup. Yeah. No, I think you're right. If it's going to happen, it would be once we've contended for a playoff spot and we're resting veterans. But I don't think that Hamilton, outside of those conditions, probably gets a call up this year. Unless he plays out of his mind down there, in which case, why not? But... Could be. But I think even even if he does, he's got a lot to prove because there's guys that management knows who you know probably already have that top of mind spot. So he's going to have to outplay a lot of people to get that. Especially if we got a guy like Byron who gets sent down there, Raymond who gets sent down there. But interesting, I don't know what the condition is. I know that the trade was for a conditional seventh round. Do you have an idea what the condition is? I would assume that it has to do with like X number of games played at the NHL level, but your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, I was trying to figure that out. I couldn't find um, Hamilton's contract. I thought maybe it was if we got him re-signed by the end of the year, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, he's a, it's no one's really sure that hasn't been released. So either way, though, I thought it was interesting with the amount of chatter online, how many people were concerned about a seventh round pick. Like to me, that's a great deal for the Flames. Even if this guy doesn't pan out, it's not like we're giving up a pick that's going to worth. Look be at worth the something. last handful of seventh round picks you have john gilmore who might not even get a contract with the flames you have matt dublow who's not going to get a contract with the flames and riley bruce who bruce has an outside chance of making it as an ahl career guy yeah you also have russian rafikov who, who can't seem to get his himself into north america for some reason he's not that useful if we can't play him on north american ice yeah and None of those picks were exactly useful in any way, shape, or form. So, it, it, who cares? It, it's you know you don't like to see picks given away for nothing, but a seventh, eh, who cares? Like if Hamilton plays an NHL game for the Flames, that's more than you would have likely ever got from anybody you would have used that pick on. I think we trade a fourth or a fifth round pick. I'd be questioning the trade because yeah. those are picks that we've seen the Flames be able to make good value from guys like Kulak, Monahan, or uh, Kulak, Goudreau, those sort of guys. But to me, for a seventh round pick, we pretty much picked up a free centerman. I know, like even a sixth round pick. Like we got Monjapan with the, our sixth last year, so like you can get good players even into the sixth round, but. For whatever reason, the seventh just seems to be where the talent goes to die. Yeah, even though the sixth, I'd say that Japan was a little bit of a an anomaly there. I mean, you know, I don't think generally we could say that you'd bring in that kind of talent in the sixth round. True. Again, I think if we were to go back and look at the history of sixth round picks for the Flames, I think Japan's going to stand out. And we have yet to see what we have in him, but just from what we've seen so far... Um, I really think that, you know, he's an exception as well. And you get exceptions in the seventh round, too. I mean, we've seen Detroit do very well with seventh round picks. Andre Palat for the exactly. Lightning. So, you know, sometimes it's going to happen, sometimes it's not. Maybe we've given up the next Andre Palat. Maybe we haven't. But it's a risk you've got to take, right? You're basing on odds. And the odds are if the guy's still available after seven picks or seven rounds and you're going to be a playoff team where you're picking in the, you know, back 15 of those, you're probably not getting a great player. Yeah. Well, even then, you if you really like a guy and you think he might be the next Palat, you'd take him in the 6th or the 5th. So, you know, it's one of those things that you don't leave somebody like that to go that long. Yeah, and knowing the Flames this year, they're probably going to have more picks than they should. Um, you know, they'll probably make some trades. They'll probably bring some more, you know, picks in. So that's going to help offset that too if there is a guy they want to be able to take him early. Oh, for sure. Like, uh, with guys like Hoodler, Russell, and, 
Raymond and Jones all being in, or yeah, not Raymond, but Jones being in the last year of their contracts and the two goalies, like they could transition a bunch of those players into draft picks if they, you know, say the Flames at the trade deadline are like 15 points out of it. Well, even in the next week, we've got to move a netminder. Yeah. Well, even if the Flames go with the three-headed monster for all of October, that's not necessarily a terrible thing, but... So, so I just wanted to go back and look. So we were talking about sixth-round picks. Japan was this year. Uh, Olus Matson was 2014. Both very good sixth-round picks. Um, before that, Tim Harrison, who, you know... He's okay. Coda Gordon. Who's now playing with the UFC Dinos. Laurent Brassois. Not bad, but he he's yeah he's not even with us anymore. He was part of the uh, the Smeed trade. That's right, um, and it, we have traditionally not had a lot of six round picks. the The next one after Brassois is a gentleman that we know. His name's Yoni Ordio, um, and then Riley Grantham. So you know, very hit and miss there. But I think if we look at this list going all the way back, you know, Jordan Fulton, um, going all the way back to the early two thousands, Brett Sutter. Uh, names like that, we could say that, okay, 6th and 7th, generally, we're not getting a lot of value out of. There's always going to be exceptions to every rule, right? Oh, yeah. Well, especially if, like, Ordeo becomes a top-tier starting goaltender, like, that would be an exception. But you don't expect that. (laughs) No, you're not going to hang on to your 7th round pick saying, maybe I'll get Yoni Ordeo. No. If you get the chance to trade for a guy of the caliber of Hamilton... You trade for him. So that's that, I thought that was an interesting move that was made, and I've wondered if the Flames would have made the same deal if the other Hamilton Dougie wasn't here. Possibly, probably not. So the next thing on our agenda is injuries. The season hasn't even started, and we've got some big injuries so far. Um, hopefully th- injuries that aren't going to cripple the Flames too much, but the two major injuries that we've sustained over training camp... TJ Brody's out with a broken bone in his hand. He's expected to be out three to six weeks. And Joel Colborn has a thumb injury, and he's listed as week to week. And unfortunately, uh, Laddie, Laddie Smead is still injured. So, Matt, let's go through our thoughts on these one by one. What's your thoughts on the Brody injury? Uh, it was a good... If you're going to have a broken bone, and same with Colborn, it, the best time to have that happen is in the middle of training camp, just due to the fact that the recovery time you'll be back like only missing like three four five games instead of like seven or eight so and it creates a spot for kulak which if he can show more then it might be a blessing in disguise because if kulak actually does cement himself as one of the top five defensemen then you get brody back then, you know, maybe you park England in the press box and just keep Kulak up here all year. I also think that the Flames not really set themselves up for this, but if this injury happened this time last year, I would have been really worried. But with Hamilton coming in, I think it's easy to say, okay, top pairings now Jordan or Hamilton, and we move forward with that. Yeah, and then you just basically run with how the Flames' defense was last year with Hamilton being in Brody's spot, and who cares? Yeah, and I think it'll be a bonus then when Brody comes back and we have a solid top three as opposed to just a solid top two. And then either England or Kulak takes over the number four spot, and whichever gets assigned or put in the press box, and you have Russell and Weidman as your third pairing. Yeah, I don't know. I can see Russell playing himself into a second pairing role. Well, I I like the chemistry between those two, so that's why I'm a little hesitant to see them broken up. Just because I I, I wouldn't be surprised to see like Russell Weidman is the number, you know, maybe a number two pair. I uh, at least right now before uh, oh, yeah, for Brody sure, comes until back, Brody gets yeah. back. But even then, I could see having like a you know Russell Hamilton or a Russell Brody pairing. We'll see. It, you can never have a problem with having too much talent on your team. It, everything, it creates options, and you just have to see. The other injury that we have, we're being equal here. We got one defenseman down and one forward down is Joe Colborn, one of our centermen. Uh, it was week to week with a thumb injury. 
Sounds to me like too many video games in the off season, but I'm not the team doctor. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is that going to affect us with the opening roster? Yeah, but it's disappointing that Colborn got hurt just due to the fact that he trained hard in the off season to get in better shape for this year, and then to be sidelined with the minor ish injury. Hopefully, when he returns, he can play effectively and have a good start to the season. For him, I feel this is like a make-or-break season for him, not only as a flame, but for his NHL career, because he needs to be able to show that he's more than a third, fourth-line guy, and he needs to be able to show that he can be a 40- or 50-point guy, and use his physicality to protect the puck and be strong on the forecheck and uh, you know a setback like that might interrupt things a bit but hopefully i, I think can... you're overestimating colborne if you think he's gonna be a 40 50 point guy you know you never know he did have a lot of points in college and that and he does have some skills so his best NHL season so far has been 28 points. I think he'd probably max out a 35-point season. How do you say larger players like Colborn usually take a while to figure out how to use their body at the NHL level? And like we saw at the end of last season that he was starting to engage more physically. So... <sighs> I think he's definitely going to use his body better, but I think you're in a. I think you're dreaming if you think that he's going to double his production and be a 40, 50 point guy. That's a first line guy. I can't see him, you know, going from where he is at 28 points a year to going more than almost double that. It's one of those things that he could have a breakout season, and it isn't much to get, like, say, another 15 points. Anybody it, could it, have one breakout season, but can you do that, you know, consecutively? I know. And that's the thing that th that's why this season's a big one for him to be able to show that, oh, I can be a 40, 50 point guy or I'm a 30 point guy. So we'll see. It, it's one of those things that he does have talent. It's just, it, it's sort of like, it's sort of like Shore where he needs to be able, he's got a good package of various talents. He's just got to be able to put them together properly and it, if he does, then I think he could be a 40, 50 point guy. If not, then, you know, he's going to be an effective third line guy that's a 30, 40 point guy. To me, I'm not so worried about the Colborn injury. I mean, I know what you're saying about, you know, it's going to hurt his development. But if I look on a scale of the entire Flames team, we have so much center depth there that it's easy for somebody to step in. If it was, you know... Monahan that got hurt or Fro Leak or one of our top guys, I'd say, yeah, maybe that's going to affect us. But for bottom six forward, you know, we, we got them uh, coming out the yin yang. Like, you know, pick pick one, anyone, and they could probably step in for, you know, a couple weeks. Oh, yeah. And a guy like, say, Josh Juris, he'll probably take Colborne's spot at least to start. Yeah. And, and it could give Juris, you know, a better showing this season because I think it'll be more responsibility on him. Josh Juris, while we're talking about him, for those that... Uh, I know I got confused. For those that have seen him, he's wearing number 16 this year. So a uh, different number to get used to for Josh Juris. Um, last injury on the docket is an old injury that's still there, is Laddie Smeet. I, I don't think Smeet played more than, what, like 20 games last year? I'd have to go check. Well, he got hurt in the first week of December. so He played 31 been, games. Yeah, it couldn't have been that many. But He had a, a minus 12 last year with one point, and really he's been out since. Do we have an ETA for his return? He is hoping to be back in the middle of October-ish. He's on the but, ice now, isn't he? Yeah, he's. it's just that he hasn't received medical clearance to be able to play, and... Whether that continues or not, who knows, and for how long. It might be one of those things that he might be out all year, or he might be ne back next week. Just won't know until the doctors give him clearance. And Smee, I mean, he's making $3.5 million this year and next year, so he's an expensive contract, and I really think that missing how much time he has, he's a guy who, like Raymond, I think is hopefully saving his money because I don't think he's going to be making anywhere near that again. 
coming off as long an injury as this, you never really see guys rebound. It's another situation where, like Raymond, he might be a candidate for a buyout in the offseason. Smead's also a guy I believe we could send down to the AHL on a conditioning stint because he's been out so long without waiver implications, and I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. Yeah. Well, especially for the fact that he hasn't played since, well, in this entire calendar year. So. Well, well, that's it. So I would not be surprised if he gets some time down there. And then, you know, hopefully uh, Kulak would give the Flames a hard choice if they want to keep Smeet around or, you know, keep him in the A or move him to somebody else. But I don't see him ever making $3.5 million again. All right. Well, that's all of our preseason news. Um, looking ahead to the season. I think for me, I was surprised today to get some news um, from the Flames camp that the game on Wednesday, the starting goaltender is going to be Ramo and Hiller is going to be backing him up. What were your thoughts when you heard that? Uh, that was pretty much what I was expecting. Uh, uh, how would you say Ramo and Hiller need to be able to give be given the opportunity to show that they're NHL goalies still? So that way, other teams can look at them and say, hey, that guy's actually pretty good. I know they need to trade one of them. I'll give them this asset or that asset and, you know, figure it out. So you think it's the flame showcasing these guys for a trade? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And in the preseason, I actually thought that Rommel was the worst of the three goalies. So it's not really a surprise for me that he's getting the first start. Just because if the Flames, say, have him internally as, like, the number three guy, then, and the most likely to trade, then if he does have a decent performance at the start, then you can more easily be able to trade him. And if you look around the league right now, pretty much every team now has their two goalies. There's no team really searching for a backup or anything. So I think the Flames are going to have to wait until there's an injury to be able to move one of their netminders. Yeah. And uh, even if, like, a team, like, say, like, the New York Islanders, Halak, he's been hurt. And they don't really, if he has a bit of struggles to start the year, then they're kind of behind the eight ball and they're in kind of the same way we're, we're wanting to be a contender like the flames are that's true so, and you need a, you need strong net mining all season to be able to be a contender yeah and if halak struggles then they're kind of screwed so the flames having three guys that can all play is a good thing it's just going to be a little bit of a headache at the beginning of the year but i don't see this lasting into november I guess the part that I'm surprised about is that Ramos starting and Hiller's backing up. I kind of expected, you're right, I think that they're trying to showcase them for a trade, but I was kind of expecting Ramos to start, Ordeo to back him up, then Hiller to start, Ordeo to back him up. Because we know that Ordeo has a problem with starts, which we haven't seen so much in the preseason, so maybe that's gone, but I kind of expected you'd want to build confidence in the young guy and not be like, hey, welcome to the team, you know, you're sitting up riding the pine. Well, or not even riding the pine, eating the popcorn. Yeah. Well, he might even get the start in on Saturday, so like I don't think it makes that much of a difference if, say, he is in the press box today and then you put Ramo in the press box on Saturday. And if you take a look this month, too, we have two sets of back-to-back games. Um, this week alone, we have two games against the Canucks. You probably want to play two different goalies against the same team. Um, so yeah, no, you're, you might be right. I think we have enough games where we can showcase all three goalies, but I don't see this going past Halloween. No, uh, I would be shocked if it went past Halloween. Cause that would give the other, all the other teams in the NHL, like if say like insert name of playoff ish team has a really bad start, like say the sharks, say Martin Jones, who they're relying on to be their number one really plays poorly at the start. Well, they need somebody because they don't really have a backup. Staylock's not very good. So... Yeah, no, I I think you're right. Um, I think that you're going to get some team who is going to... Some team who's going to panic a little bit, like you said. They're going to say, okay, we're expecting to be a playoff team. It's not going our way so far. We have to make a quick change. And I think... 
the easiest change for some of these teams would be let's you know bring in another goalie not necessarily trade our starter but let's bring in another goalie yeah well you saw that with minnesota last year that they had two guys that were doing all right not great but all right and they're like well dubnik's playing in arizona and he's doing all right let's bring him in and made them a playoff team again so you know it, i'm sure that we'll see something similar it's just it's going to be a little weird having three guys for a month or so do you have a prediction as to which two goalies are still wearing a flames jersey come november one i would lean hiller and ordeo I think Ramo's going to go just due to the fact that Ramo and Ordeo are the same style of goaltender. And that I like that... I think part of the reason why the Flames were so successful was the difference in style. Like, especially with how, like, the Flames would pull one of them and the other guy would, like, shut the door on them. I think the contrasting style was part of the reason why that happened. Could very well be. Um, do you think that it could have anything to do with the Flames trying to lock one of them up right now, and whichever one they get locked up first will stick around? Because all our goalies are on one-year deals. I don't know. I honestly, I don't even know if the Flames will re-sign either of them at this point, so... I hadn't thought about that till today when a friend of mine had mentioned that as a possibility. I thought, nah, maybe, but yeah, I don't know that I would want to sign them for near the money they're making now. Yeah, well, you got to figure that with Gaudreau and Monaghan's contracts coming up and Russell's and Hoodler's, that they're going to need money somewhere. And if, say, Gillies plays really well this season in Stockton, and you have Ordeo who's proven that he can play at the NHL level, you can save like $7 million by saying goodbye to both Rommel and Hiller at the end of the year and dumping that cash towards the other guys who are needing the contracts. Yeah, I think I'd still want a veteran goalie, but I think if I was the GM right now at, you know, October 5th, I would say, you know what, I'll let whichever goalie I keep, I'll let him go to UFA and, you know, make him a reasonable offer for probably a backup slash 1B role. If he takes a grade, if not, I'll find somebody else. I don't think that we're requiring Hiller and or Ramo to be here next year. Pending audio develops the way we expect him to. That's the thing. Development's always, you know, never a linear process. So and audio, audio could slower, just fall off. You can off. always throw another one-year contract to whoever you keep. You know, I don't think either guy wants out of town. I think a trade's going to be disappointing for whoever gets traded. And the only, the only reason I think that Ramo might be the guy who stays is Ramo more than Hiller in the past. We've seen rise to the occasion when there's a challenge. Um, you know, when Rado Barra came up and Joey McDonald wasn't his backup anymore, we saw Ramo rise to the challenge. Last year, when Hiller took the net, we saw Ramo rise to the challenge. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Ramo rise to the challenge of, you know, trying to win a spot and Hiller being the odd man out because of that. Very well could be. That's just something I've noticed is that Ramo seems to do better under pressure than Hiller. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that you can make a good argument for either of them. Like mine with like contrasting styles, yours with Ramo seems to perform better when challenged. It it really more so than anything depends on what the other team needs. Like if you got a guy like say Tampa with Bishop, well Bishop and Hiller are very similar in terms of style, so they might want a Ramo goalie instead to go with that to have the same contrasting style, but. It, Another team might have a guy that's more similar to Ramo, so they might want Hiller to create that contrast. You don't know. If you were Trilliving right now looking to move one of your goalies, um, what are you looking for back? Are you looking for a roster player with as deep as our roster is? Are you looking for a draft pick? What, what would you be looking for? For me, what I would want is a mid-round pick, at least a third maybe a fourth, depending on the other asset, and a player that is either in Europe or in the NCAA. That way you don't have to add them into the organization, like either the NHL or the AHL this year, 
and you can have some leeway in terms of development. Like, especially if the guy's in his first or second year in the NCAA, you have a little bit of time and breathing room to bring him in. But that's basically what I would be asking for, something along those lines. I think if it's only the goalie going out, I think that the key piece coming back our way has to be a pick. I, you're right, it might be a third. I'd love to see us get a second or even a first. Um, I, don't I think just we, don't see with the market as it no, is that you'd get a first. No, That's, I don't think we get a first. I think we might be able to pull off a second. Yeah, it, again, it would depend on the team, and you would probably get nothing else in addition to. And I'd so, be fine with that. Yeah. So, it depends. The other thing I can see them doing is bundling a goalie with somebody. Maybe it's like, you know, it's Hiller and um, Raymond, or it's Hiller and Jones, or it's Hiller and England, or somebody like that. And that's where you might get a larger package coming back our way. Or maybe you get a second and a couple prospects. Um, I think that they're, those or are the two... Or a roster th- player. Yeah, it could be that we're moving out a couple roster players for one roster player and a prospect. You know, maybe we move a goalie and a defenseman for, you know, a four, like a, you know, four, five, five, six defenseman and a prospect or a pick. Um, but I, I don't think I've heard people say it's going to be like an eight player blockbuster. It's not. I mean, I think all you're going to get is you're going to get a goalie for a pick and maybe some, you know, fodder there. Or you're going to get a goalie in one of our guys who's on waivers or we need to get rid of like an England or some of like that. We're going to eat part of that deal and maybe you'll get a roster player back. But I don't, I don't think we're going to make this like, you know, deal of Hiller and England and Ramo, or sorry, Hiller and England and Raymond and Byron for somebody. Like, you know, we're not making a wholesale trade at this point. No. Plus, there's no, no buyer that's going to want to take on that much asset and that much salary at this point. No. And if that was the case, like we'd probably be getting a couple stinker contracts back. That's it. Yeah, you'd have to take backs on Terrible, which at this point we can't do. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm still expecting the shoe to drop on a trade sooner rather than later. I don't see it lasting till uh, the end of October, but I think, you know, we'll probably get each guy a start and reassess after that. So what are your thoughts on how the season's looking. You know, I, I talked a lot about this, um, I think, in our training camp episode. As far as overall of the season, I think that this year we're coming in with no extra spots. I think last year there was no expectation on this team. I think that there was really... We had no expectation. We were expecting a terrible team and a terrible season, and nobody really expected anything. And then the team started to gel, and you know we were still sitting here you know, in March saying, geez, are we going to make the playoffs? Maybe, maybe not. And then it all just came together. And I think the biggest thing the Flames have to worry about this year is expectations now and living up to some of these expectations. And we've seen recently teams like Toronto, teams like Colorado, who've beat the expectations, and then they've had a terrible year the next year. And I think we have to make sure that doesn't happen to us. And I think that the key will be the play of the first line. Like, if Hoodler, Monaghan, and Gaudreau have anywhere near a similar season, I don't see the Flames missing the playoffs, especially with the fact that our division is kind of terrible outside of Anaheim. And that's one thing that I think might work in our favor this year that we can't rely on for the future, but I think it might buy us one more year of postseason hockey. Yeah. Because, like, you look at Vancouver, they've been pretty bad in the preseason. Edmonton, even with McDavid's, not going to improve enough to make the playoffs. San Jose didn't really do anything except swap out their goalie. L.A. is still the same, more or less. So, you know, everybody's kind of in the middle, and who knows, but I think the Flames still have a better shot just due to the fact that they have younger players that are developing. So let me ask you two more questions then. Um, what, where do you think the Flames finish in the West? I think that they finish second in our division behind Anaheim, but like healthily behind Anaheim, like 10, 12, 14 points behind them. Probably in the 98 to 100 point range, give or take. Do you think we play postseason hockey this year? Yeah. I I think that we'll end up playing the LA Kings in the first round. Okay. And 
it's one of those things. It depends on the goaltending. If the Flames, like, I'm kind of expecting Ordeo to steal the job. If he does and becomes a good number one, then I think the Flames might actually make some noise in the playoffs and possibly make a run to the finals. But that that would require a lot of things going correctly. <laughs> See, as much as I want to think Ordeo is going to steal the job, I think he's going to do an adequate job, but I think he's going to be bailed out by a good defense this year. We'll see. And the Flames have enough talent in the organization where if things go correctly, they could be a cup contender, but things would have to go correctly. And an injury here or a little regression there, and the Flames could be just battling to even make the playoffs. So we'll see. I think we'll probably end up about seventh in the West, probably second in our division, so sixth or seventh in the West. Um, I definitely think we see playoff hockey this year. I think we have to with... Our, it seems like our whole division almost, except for Anaheim, is in a bit of a rebuild. Yeah. And I just think that we're the furthest or along in that rebuild. Pattern, one or the yeah, other. Yeah, well, that's it. Like, they're not sure what to do, but I think that we're the furthest along. We're the only other team with a plan that's been executed. Edmonton has one in their head, but it's going to take a while. Um, so I think that we might kind of make it in just by default because of that. Do you think that at the end of this season... Um, we are going to look back at this season and say that this is a monumental season for the Flames. You know, do you think we're going to say that they out... I think last year they outperformed expectations. I think we could say that if we look at the rebuild, that was a monumental season for them. Do you think that we're going to outplay expectations again, or do you think that we now have heightened expectations that the team's just going to meet? I think they'll either meet or slightly exceed. I don't think that they can exceed them... Like, put There's this no way, way we're going to be exceed... first in the West. Yeah, uh, to exceed them by the same amount that we did last year, we'd have to pretty much win the President's Trophy, which, give me a break. <laughs> you know, like, that would be, like, everything going 100% perfectly, and, yeah, that, yeah, no. Do you think we have to make the playoffs for this team to be a success this year? No. Actually, believe it or not, no. As long as the young players continue developing, if things don't go our way like because you also have to remember Giordano is coming off a, a pretty spectacular injury and if he doesn't play as well that might limit the whole team he's coming back from one and Brody's currently on a big injury yeah so if the Flames don't make the playoffs but all the young players progress in a good fashion then the season's still a success it's just that it the casual fan might be disappointed because we did make it to the second round last year, but it's not a big deal. And if the guys are making that good progress, that'll carry over to next season and the season beyond because then the Flames can say, okay, we need to get rid of such and such depth players and get more guys in there, more young guys in. And to me, I think, you know, I'm seeing much more excitement for the season starting than I have in years, probably since, you know, the year after we ran against Tempa to the Cup in 04. But I don't want to see the Flames brass get caught up in this and make deals for veterans at the deadline just to get to the playoffs. Like you said, I think it's still a rebuild. And it's still a, you know, young guy first, kid first, if you will, organization i think we have to make sure those young guys are getting a chance and even if we don't make the playoffs if we're playing well and we're getting guys who are taking jobs from veterans to me we've done everything we need to do this year yeah well plus i another reason why i don't think the flames will make trades for veterans is just due to the fact that the playoff pool is kind of bare for guys that are not in the ahl so we will need guys to start filtering in and taking the spots in the AHL after guys like Granlin, Klimchuk, Poirier actually graduate to the NHL. Because right now it's basically Jankowski and that's about it. So there's a couple guys, but not too many. So the Flames will need to be able to restock the prospect pool with draft picks. So I don't see the flames jettisoning too many picks this year. 
Well, what, what do you say we leave it there and we will do some more analysis of the team next week after we've seen them on the ice for two games? Yep, sounds um, like a plan. Let's. It was very popular last year in our end-of-year survey. We got a lot of feedback that people really liked our weekly predictions that we did. Um, so why don't we start doing those again? Um, we Last year, if you some people want to start picking the score of every game, and to me that's really hard to do. But I'd say let's just do uh, wins, losses, ties like we did before. This week we've got two games. Uh, we start the home opener, which I believe is actually the first game of the whole season. Um, interesting fact, I believe the last time we played the first game of the whole season against Vancouver was the year that we started the season in Japan, and a lot of people don't remember that. So a little bit of a throwback. That was, what, 2000 or 2001? 98, I think. 98, wow. That was the year they had the horse jersey. That's all I remember. So there you go, 98. So that was that was a long time ago, and they don't do the Japan opener anymore. But um, we play Vancouver on Wednesday in Calgary, and it's an 8 p.m. start. We got a couple days off, and then Saturday we travel to Vancouver to play the Canucks again. Uh, Matt, four points on the table, two games. How do you think we do? I think we're going to get two points. Uh, I think we'll win in Vancouver, and we'll drop the home opener. I'm going for a three-point week. I think that we can take Vancouver to overtime in Calgary. Um, I don't know that we'll beat them, um, whether it's three-on-three or shootout, but I think we'll get one point out of it. And I agree with you. I think we'll take them in Vancouver. I'm also not all that confident with Ramo starting in Calgary, so that's another reason I think that we might drop that one. But Yeah. Well, as long as the Flames can get 16 points every month, they'll be a playoff team. So that's the number, because about 96 points, if you divide it by 6, works out to 16, so just got to keep that up. So that's, if we look at that purely as wins, that's 8 wins a month? Yeah. So any way to get to 16, that's what the goal needs to be And we're playing month. about 15 games a month? Yeah, so just slightly above... 500. So I was going to say, we pretty much need to play 500 hockey all year, which I think is doable. Um, I'm looking through the schedule today, and unlike in the past, there's I don't see any really... I mean, it's going to depend on how teams do, but just based on their performance from last year, I'm not seeing any really tough blocks in the schedule. No. We you know we have some, some points where we have back-to-backs, but it looks like all season we pretty much always have like two, three days off before most major blocks of games. We got some big home stands, which is going to be nice. Like in December, we have two weeks where we're at home consecutively. Uh, we don't have any really long road stands because of the briar or anything. So, I mean, it's obviously going to depend where teams are at and which teams are troubling, but I don't look at this schedule and say right away, here's a point we're going to have a problem with. Yeah, it's not like we're playing St. Louis, Minnesota, Anaheim, LA, like all like for like two weeks it's just like teams like that it, there's no no stretch like that so no and we only have one stretch where we're on the road for more than like four games in a row um and it looks like that's in march we're on the road pretty much for two weeks they make one stop back in calgary but yeah i mean there's no like really terrible road stretches because the bry or anything this year yep so hopefully the flames can be consistent this year like they were last year and no eight game losing streaks in December. And <laughs> yeah, and I'm hoping that the fact we have more rest days, like I'm even looking in December, like we play on the twenty second and then not again until the twenty seventh. So they get a nice Christmas break. But you know, even this month, I mean we've got like a game this Wednesday and then one on Saturday and then another one until Tuesday. I'm hoping that with those rest days it's gonna keep our team from getting so banged up. And that might be one of the things that, you know, either makes or breaks us. Well, Matt, enjoy the first couple of games. I know you'll be at the home opener. Um, I'll be watching it eagerly on TV and also the Saturday game. And I'm hoping that we're both wrong and we come home with four points. But let's hope that the Flames win, lose, or draw. That they set the tone for the season. I know last year everyone said the Flames were tough to play against. And people said they didn't want to come to the Dome. And I hope that we get out early and we establish that right away. For sure. Coming off of what, two, two, win, two losses against Winnipeg in the preseason, I'm hoping that we can snap this. And traditionally, the Flames have not done well at the beginning of the year. Generally, they go on a bit of a losing streak in October. So let's hope that we snap that. Yeah. All right, well, have a good week. 
Thanks, everybody, for listening. Go Flames, go. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.